Hi, welcome to Go Ahead, Write Something, the podcast for writers who want motivation, the nitty gritty and more gritty about getting published and how to enjoy writing your stories and sharing them with the world. Today, our guest is Christina Thompson, editor of the Harvard Review. And if you write short fiction, poetry, essays, or book reviews, this will be useful. Harvard Review is open to writers of all levels, and we'll talk about what it takes to get Christina to say yes. Christina teaches writing at Harvard University Extension and is the author of two books, Come On Shore and We Will Kill and Eat You All, a New Zealand story and recently Sea People, The Puzzle of Polynesia, a triple award winner and the Boston Globe says, has the page turning qualities of an all absorbing mystery. Hi, I'm Pat Dunn, AKA TM Dunn, three-time novelist, writing teacher and coach and director at the Westport Writers Workshop. And I'm Tessa Smith McGovern, author and writing teacher at the Writing Institute, Sarah Lawrence College, and the Westport Library's Westport Writes program. Christina, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> You're welcome. So, would you mind if we first talk about Harvard Review um, for writers who are listening who are working on short stories, memoirs, uh, poems, essays? What kind of submissions do you look for? Do you, is there anything you don't get enough of? Um, we get a lot of everything. <laughs> um, it's not a very easy journal uh, to get into just because we only publish twice a year. And so there aren't that many spots. We do also publish online though. And um, so we have Harvard View online as well. And that expands the opportunity quite a lot, especially for fiction writers. Um, we publish about four or five, sometimes six stories per print issue. Um, so that's not very many over the course of a year. Um, mm -hmm. We publish stories of all lengths, very short stories, very couple of pages and quite long stories. I think the longest story maybe have been 12 or 14,000 words, which is pretty mm -hmm. long, mm -hmm. heading for novella length. Um, we publish stories by all kinds of writers at all stages of their careers. We love to debut authors. It's one of the things that we like most in the world. We in right. fact have an, a story in the next, in the upcoming issue, which is by a young writer who has never published anything before. So that's- wow totally exciting for us. And I think also for him. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but we also have, um, you know, as with most of the kind of, you know, kind of maybe more traditional literary journals, we also like to have work by very well-known writers. So we will have, you know, Laura Vandenberg or, um, you know, Alice Hoffman. I was just talking to Alice Hoffman the other day and we're going to republish some stories of hers. So it's really a mix. Mm -hmm. It's really a mix. And in terms of essays, we really like uh, basically a personal essay, not so much. We do publish some literary criticism on the web. Um, we have also a translation focus on online. So that's an interesting space for people who are working in translation. Um, but for the essays, mainly it's kind of personal essays about something, something interesting. I had one just coming up, which was about the golden records on the 1977 Voyager spacecraft, the ones that oh, were, wow. you know, that were, made to, to 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 tell space aliens what you know people on earth sounded like and what they thought about it was that kind was of so a funny interesting. project so it was a great little essay Fascinating. So that's well you have a story. lovely you have a great facebook page as well as the harvard review online where people can go and sample content and i was reading a couple of the stories and it's the stories are very accessible they're very readable they're not at all dense or obscure or you know people might might have might not realize that. So there's one in particular I wanted to ask you about, which is called New Arrivals, which is about 3,000 words. And it kind of reads like memoir. Um, and it's a lovely story. I found it delightful. But it doesn't jump out at you the way, for example, another story, the John from Yongmyo Park does mm. that's that was absolutely gripping and I defy anyone to read that story and not be glued to get to the end um but so with new arrivals um I know the author's name is Will Powers was it Will Powers um what made you say yes to that story and then people can read the story and they can think about your reply and that might be helpful um I 
sometimes have told people, interns, for example, in the past, that there is a kind of a story I like in which not much happens. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I had a, an example of this by a woman from New Hampshire, a writer from New Hampshire, who um, wrote a story in which this is what happened. She uh, went to pick up her father, her elderly father, and then she drove him to the hardware store. And then they went home. And I think that's what happened in the story. <laughs> All right. So but nothing happens. But what was it compelling was, about it? Yes. Well, to me, you know, to me, it was the relationship between the woman and her father. He was, it was set in Maine or New Hampshire or someplace. And that was a very sort of, he had a kind of cantankerous Yankee quality, um, very unwilling to say anything. And mm -hmm. she was slightly exasperated with him. And at the same time, uh, you know, fond of him and caring for him in an interesting way. And so there was this sort of tension in their relationship, which was both, um, you know, kind of loyalty and uh, familial feeling and also sort of irritation. And, and, and so that rang incredibly true to me uh, of a, a, a very a sort of true capture of a certain kind of experience, a very specific experience. He was a very specific character culturally. Um, and I love stories like that, where there's something where somebody just kind of captures uh, something the about the world that they know, the mm -hmm. world that maybe that they come from, and it can be any world. It can be yeah. any part of the world. It can be any culture. It can be any kind of anything. Um, and what was the title of that story? You know, I can't remember. It was a really long time ago, and I've always oh, I'll, okay. I'll look it up for you, and you can post it someplace. Okay, I'll That's put wonderful. it. If, but it was it was, it was it was it was just a good example of there are stories like that where um, what is going on is not primarily plot. You know, it's not primarily Perfect. action. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I'm very committed to action. I believe action is very important to stories. But in this case, the action tended to be sort of in the words. It was in the in the dialogue, you know, between the in the conversation between the characters. There wasn't anything really else going on. And there wasn't really any suspense, except people did want to kind of see how this relationship unfolded. So that's not the only kind of thing I like. But I do think it's a subtle kind of a story. And I am I am drawn to those in addition to the stories where, <clears throat> you know, um, dramatic or radical actions are taking place. Um, right. And do you, do you remember in new arrivals when you were reading that story, was there a point, did you get to the end of the first page and think, yes, I want this? Well, I definitely think, um, that I know quickly, I know quickly whether I will read to the end. Mm -hmm. And that is a function of the actual writing. So this is now we're talking about a slightly different thing, which is not the structure of the story or the characters or the plot or the action or any of it, but the actual prose. Yeah. <clears throat> the prose for me is the make or break part of, of, of editing or, or you know reading as an editor. If mm -hmm. I read the first page or two and I feel that the prose is um, not, if it doesn't have the feeling of intentionality, if it doesn't feel to me as though the writer has really thought about the words, has really chosen the words that matter, and has been willing to uh, cut the words that are not serving the purpose, yeah. because a lot of novice writers just don't cut enough. Yeah. That's really the single biggest problem that they have is that they yeah, are not strict That's actually a good point. Enough. Yeah, well, they're not strict, strict, strict enough. Do you mind if you just repeat that? Because I know working with Sure, writers, this is a thing that I teach constantly yeah. when, yes, I'm, when I'm it's teaching it's is, is when you write a thing and you write it out the way it comes out of your head, and then you go back and you say to yourself, do I need this word? Do I need this word? Do I need this word? And all of the words that aren't doing anything or that are actually making the sentence worse. So for example, if you have, I, we had an example in a class the other day where a woman was talking about a fresh face, long legged model. And I said to her, you know, if you say the word model to me, I know that she has long legs. Exactly. I mean, there's just no chance yes. that you are talking about a short, fat model. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> probably. Like basically, it's already encoded in the word, you know, yeah. the idea of long leggedness and also fresh facedness. I mean, you're not going to have yeah. some hag, right? I mean, it's <laughs> it's already built into the not to the noun. So the piling up of adjectives is a classic sort of beginner's problem yeah. or beginner's mistake. And so looking, thinking very seriously about your adjectives is a very good place to start. And your adverbs, of course, the same thing. You just don't need most of them. Mm -hmm. um, you want strong verbs, strong nouns, and then a little bit of um, amplification with those other words. But, but the sentence also has to have, um, so you, you have to ask yourself, does it have, uh, what I ask myself when I'm writing is, does it have too many clauses? Because my tendency is to write 
sometimes a very back wordish <laughs> sentence with clauses in the Lots beginning maybe comments. that are that's because you have long clever yes. thoughts <laughs> that's <laughs> what that is <laughs> I also think it's because I was raised by somebody who was born in the beginning of the 20th century and she was raised by her grandparent grandmother so we had a very antique um syntax that was very normal for us um so I have that but but everybody has their own little version of this so whatever it is you do you got to go back and trim it you know, go back and clean it up. So that's a very important writing step. So I, I can tell when someone has not done that. Mm -hmm. So if I start to read a page and I see that um, the sentences are what we call baggy, meaning they have words in them that they don't need, or they have, they don't have a, they don't have a kind of, you know, the ear isn't good. The person hasn't read them aloud. You must always read your sentences aloud. I mean, really you have to, in order to hear them because they have a music to them. They have a rhythm to them. Um, one of my young writers I noticed recently, I, when I went back through one of his stories, I realized that <clears throat> he was using the same words in to, he would use the word say, look, but he would say somebody looks and then something was looking like, and it, they were in too close proximity, those yeah. words. So you have to change one of those, I mean, no big deal, right? But mm -hmm. it made me think that he hadn't been really hearing his own sentences quite as clearly as he should have. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And do you also find it the other way around where people are not using enough words or they cut too much um yeah I don't find that too much yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> much. Yeah. yeah I really find that usually I mean sometimes you know when I when I teach I teach young writers as well it's true with the young writers yeah and that they don't that you know you need to say to them look dig a little deeper you know come up with a little bit more in the way of description then we'll go back and trim it all out again <laughs> It's a little bit unfair, but I mean, yeah, sometimes, yeah, especially okay. with younger writers, they haven't thought hard enough about how to, how to describe a thing, um, how to really evoke a, a, a sensation or to how to describe a thing you see or something you hear or whatever. So you have to, you have to work at that stuff. That doesn't, it's not just like, you Well, know. do you see like mediums like texting having a big influence on that? You know, like everybody's very LOL, or I can't even think of some of the uh, abbreviations that people use that I have no idea what they mean like instead of see later t whatever yeah i so i think one thing about this which is that um and i noticed this just recently because i just had a couple well, the last few issues i've had a couple of stories go by quite young writers through a copy editor who was a a real kind of pro but also somebody who had fairly formal copy editing training in the publishing world and she found their writing to be, um, I think, slightly irritating <laughs> because it was filled with a level, it had a level of informality, which was related to speech. So they were, they were writing, even their expository prose was a little speech-like um, and it had a little bit, so it was grammatically a little, uh, sometimes a little incorrect or a little bit, um, you know, uh, I, I don't know exactly. I don't really know what it was. Colloquial? I mean, yeah, it was colloquial, but also kind of in some cases actually wrong. Um, yeah. So, And I didn't mind that. I, I just heard them. I heard the sound of their writing as a sound, a particular sound coming out of a particular kind of milieu, a, a different, it was a, it was a, and, and I know they're young writers. So mm -hmm. I know that it's coming. Oh, so boy. I think there is a level of informality that is slightly different. And this is generational. Mm -hmm. Um whether that has anything to do with texting or not, it might be just the general culture of writing that is changing somewhat. But so I do that, think there is this, uh, that something's happening. Great. That's actually a perfect segue to um, the next topic, which is to do with your personal story. So you have three boys. Mm -hmm. So perhaps you're used to that sound, you know, you're used to, you're familiar with it and it didn't bother you. Um, so with your own writing, I want to, I'm putting this up on screen. If you're just listening, then have a look at see people at the cover it's glorious and there are some lovely color photos inside so um you have two books out one is common shore and we will kill and eat you all which has more of your personal story in it and then Great this title. yes isn't it wonderful and then this one see people the puzzle of polynesia so what drew your focus to polynesia why is this material important to you Right. Um, I am from New England, so um, I, I I live here now, but I also grew up here, and um, 
I went to, at some point in my young adulthood, I went off to graduate school in Australia. So I went to the Pacific myself and before I knew anything about it. And then I eventually ended up staying there for quite a long time, 15 years in Australia. And in the course of that time, I went to New Zealand and I went to the islands and I went to a lot of places. And I also married um, a man from New Zealand who uh, is, um, to whom I'm still married. <laughs> um, uh, but so I had a lot of firsthand experience of the region. And I also at the same time was doing graduate work, which um, <clears throat> was really focused on the history and literature of the region. So that was, it was, it, it was my personal experience really originally that the, as a, as a youngish person that took me, that got me started in this field. And um, I will tell people to go to your Facebook page because you have some lovely pictures of your children, which is just delightful. Um, it, these books actually really struck me as a sort of a legacy of love for your boys and your husband, for your family. Uh, would you say that that's, does it feel like that to you? Uh, you know, I, I'm... I don't post on Facebook very often anymore, but I do know that I have this kind of archive because every once in a while I go there and then it pops up with a picture of my kids from 10 years ago. It's quite entertaining. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I do think it has this, it does It does have that archival feel to me now. Um, I, I, I think all of these places are now kind of our own personal archives, our repositories mm -hmm. of sort of a mixture of the events that happened to us and the, and the pictures that we post and so forth. Yeah. And what, so tell us what Sea People is about. It's won three prizes, which is fantastic. Congratulations. So Thank what's you. the mystery? What's it about? Um, it's, it's a book about the, um, the story of how a certain part of the world, which is the, the sort of mid Pacific. So the really the big empty middle of the Pacific ocean, how it was settled a thousand to 2000 years ago by uh, these uh, voyagers who came from Asia in canoes, and those are the ancestors of the Polynesian people. So Hawaiians, Tahitians, Maori in New Zealand, Easter Islanders, Rapa Nui, and so on. Um, Samoans, Tongans are also in this category. And they're, it's one, they're one big kind of cultural family, and they haven't been out there that long. But the, the, the point of the whole thing is that until they got there, that part of the world was had never seen humans before. No people were ever able to reach that part of the world. And this is not that long ago. This is a time when people were already living, you know, they were living in the jungle, they were living on the ice, mm -hmm. they were living in the highest mountains of the world, they were living on, in the deserts, they were living in every kind of part, every environment of the earth, but not in the on the islands in the middle of the Pacific, because they are so hard to reach. Mm -hmm. So when the people first, the first people to figure out how to do that is this group of people. And then once they figured it out, they were out there for a long time before anybody else turned up. And then the story changes again. So mm -hmm. that is the story of, and, and, you know, originally when I started thinking about writing it, I thought I'll tell the story of these great voyagers. And, and then I started thinking about, okay, well, how do I know the story of these great voyagers? And then I started thinking, well, it's the story of the evidence that's the story <laughs> because true, we yeah. aren't there. We can't look back in time. There are no written records from that time. So what is the evidence for how this happened? And also there've been a lot of arguments about it over the last 300 years. So it was an interesting subject because people have been fighting about it and disagreeing with one another. So um, you've, so obviously you've done a lot of research for this book and probably most of your work um, there's this idea that when people are writing fiction, I also find with my students that they, if it's not historical fiction, they don't need to do the same amount of research. Um, can you talk a little bit about the kind of research that you believe needs to go into the work that people do, even but fiction, especially? I mean, this is sort of, for me, this is kind of interesting, is interestingly connects with the question of whether or not what people should do when they're stuck. And what then this, my suggestion is read. Um, you know, whenever you don't know what you're doing, you should read, just read. And you can, I think you people should read quite promiscuously. I mean, I am at the moment reading, God, I'm reading, I'm reading a book on the Reformation. I'm reading a novel about, um, about, um, missionaries. I'm reading a whole bunch of historical works about different kind about writing, about the history of writing. I'm reading, um, I'm reading a book about, DNA in the in the Americas. I mean, you know, I feel like it's just brain food. You know, <laughs> it, it it's what you do to to kind of keep yourself thinking because I think you need to keep thinking. Now, if I were writing a novel, I, I don't really know how, how I would do it. I might do it a little differently because at the moment I'm trying to put together, I'm trying to assemble a lot of different. I, I'm trying to 
find the connections between a number of different sort of strands that interest me. So I'm trying to tie them all together and I'm sort of following each one of them separately and thinking about the connections. Mm. But I do, I noticed just the other day, actually on Twitter, a friend of mine who's a novelist um, who is in the throes of writing a novel and tweets about it a lot, I think when he's bored with himself. And he was talking about how much he had just done so much research and was not going to use any of it. I'm like, yeah, that's the game. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. you do yeah, a lot, awkward. a lot, a lot, a lot of reading and a lot of sourcing and a lot of research and you, then you don't use it all. Mm -hmm. And do you find it's that reading that keeps you writing? Is that part of it? Well, it definitely helps me have ideas. And mm -hmm. if I, I didn't have ideas, I don't know why I would be writing. You know, if I didn't, if I didn't have something to say, I wouldn't, mm -hmm. I wouldn't sit down and do it because it's not all that fun. <laughs> I don't think it's all that fun. <laughs> what, what is the most fun part of the process for you? Oh, being done. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit, yeah. just, we just have a moment or two left. Tell us about your writing practice. How often, what, what time of day, any special tricks? Yeah, I'm a bad model for anything like this. I'm, I'm a very irregular writer. I have a, you know, I have a halftime job as an editor. I teach a lot of courses. I have still a family um, that needs stuff. So I mm -hmm. am pulled in a lot of directions. So I write when I can. Um, and I don't, beat myself up for not being able to do it every day because it just isn't realistic for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I like to get chunks of time when I can really think about something, but I think th the process is different depending on what stage you're at. You know, when I'm starting a project, I don't really need the same level of intensity because I'm still reading a lot and thinking a lot. And if I write in small chunks, it's kind of okay. And there's a certain point where you need to stretch and you need to really have continuity and you have to sustain your attention. And then I think it's very hard to be pulled in different directions. I once had a fellowship when I was finishing Sea People. I had a fellowship in which I got, I wrote half the book in one year and the other half, I think took me four years, the first half, you know, because of, I didn't have to teach and, and edit and everything. And I really had time mm -hmm. and I really could knock it out. Yeah, so that was fantastic. I, I just want to say, thank you to to people who give fellowships to writers because it's yeah. please keep yes, doing it please keep doing it do it a bit more, more. Do more please yeah. keep doing it yeah that's really 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 helpful okay so our last question pat is i guess is there anything that you would um advise publication's hard and we know it's taken a whole different turn these days uh and there's more places to publish than ever and it's harder than ever in some ways is there any advice that you can give to writers as to how to get their work out into the world? Well, I think one thing that's quite important is not to be um, overly uh, disheartened by rejection. Rejection mm -hmm. is a normal part of the process for everybody. I've just had seven grant applications rejected in sequence um, after I won, you know, a very big prize in a national prize in Australia. Mm -hmm. And then even in Australia, I didn't get some of these things. And I'm like, okay, you know, it's just a hard game. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, not to be too, to, and if you don't get in, you send something to Harvard Review and it doesn't get published, doesn't really matter. Just keep going. Mm -hmm. Just keep going. Just keep going. That's sort of my advice. I think if you I think if you're serious and you really want to do it, you'll you'll probably be able to. But yes. you have to try. Yeah, you have to try. One yeah. quick question to that. A lot of times people will get letters that said, well, we weren't interested in this piece, but we really like your writing. We encourage you to send again. And often uh, I hear writers say, oh, they don't really mean it. But do they really mean it? Oh, they mean it. If they say I, that, I they mean it. They, they mean absolutely it. mean it, a hundred percent. Because nobody encourages anybody that they, whose work they don't want to see again. Yeah, yeah, they that's what it. I say. But I just want you to back that up. Yeah, so. <laughs> no, absolutely right. Okay. Yes. That is all thank we have. You. We that's all we have time for today. So thank you so much, Christina, for sharing your wisdom. <laughs> well, thanks for inviting me. It's lovely chatting with you. <laughs>